Moana Mackey. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, that was an extraordinary contribution um, from from Mr. Todd McClay. He spent the better part of, of his speech talking about himself and thanking people. You weren't winning an Academy Award, Mr. McClay. It was meant to be a debate on the Prime Minister's statement, but most of the first part of the speech was talking about himself and all the people who've supported him throughout his career and thanking them. And then, then we got to um, the, the take-home messages from Mr. McClay's speech were one, I want to justify tax cuts for the wealthy. That's right. Tax cuts for the wealthy that overwhelmingly go to people who don't need them and didn't ask for them are good for this country. That was his first message. His second message was don't support children. Don't support children. That's a bad idea to ensure that every kid in this country gets the best start in life. Uh, and this coming, from, this coming from the party that taxed paper boys, that taxed paper boys on their income, we know that they don't want to support uh, children, those little bludgers. They just want to tax them on their paper routes and they don't want to see a government that's going to take the tax cuts that were given to the wealthiest New Zealanders and distribute them to the most important people in this country who are our future, the children of this country country. And then his final message was, you know what, everything's great. Everything's fine. Well, you know what, Mr McClay, everything's not fine. And everything is not great in New Zealand at the moment. And the National Party might think that just by saying the Crosby Texter playbook lines over and over again, that they're going to fool New Zealanders into thinking that everything is great. But every time Kiwi families open the power bill or go to the supermarket or have to pay their rent, they know that things aren't great. And they know that this government isn't listening, that they arrogantly just want to tell them that they're wrong. Because you know what? In the big end of town, things probably are pretty good at the moment. That's right. But most New Zealanders are struggling to keep their heads above water, and too many are going backwards. And I want to talk about um, a young single mum that I met who, who came to tell me her story in my office. And she said to me, you know, she, she's on the DPB, she's trying to do good by her kids, so her bills are paid uh, automatically. They come out before she sees the money hitting her account. And then one week that didn't happen. So one week she ended up with a whole lot of money in her account and uh, she got a rush of blood to the head. She's human and she spent it and she shouldn't have. And she rang budget advisory because she was so upset. She knew that she had to pay it back. She didn't know how she was going to do it. She was scared she was going to get into trouble. Uh, and budget advisory went to see her. And when they went round there, you know, they were expecting that she'd spent the money on alcohol or, or cigarettes. And you know what she'd spent that money on, Mr Speaker? She'd spent it on non-perishable food. She'd filled her pantry with that money. And she said to me, I, I know I shouldn't have done it, but she said, I just wanted that security, to feel that security that I hadn't felt for a long time of knowing where the next couple of weeks' meals are going to come from. And she said, and I wanted to be able to say to my kids tonight, you get to eat until you're full. When did food become a luxury item in this country? Because I tell you what, it is under this government. In New Zealand, food should not be a luxury item. And for too many families, it is. And Nick Smith can say rubbish, but I was moved by that young woman who came to see me because it shows that New Zealand has changed. And it hasn't changed for the better. And Todd McClay and Simon Bridges can laugh. But the fact is, that's a reality out there for too many of our families. That's a reality out there for too many of our children. And you tell me that 60 bucks a week isn't going to help. Because I tell you, it will, and I'm proud of that policy. I'm proud of that policy. So I want to talk to, a little bit about power prices. A little bit about power prices. Because Simon Bridges constantly tells us, and John Key constantly tells us, that power prices are competitive that power prices aren't too high. And we know that that simply isn't true. We have flattening demand for electricity in this country. We have an oversurplus of generation. We have a collapsed carbon price. If power prices aren't going to go down now, Mr Bridges, they are never going down. So this side of the House is saying we're going to do something about that. We're going to bring down power prices. And what's Simon Bridges' response to this? Oh, People can go on the website if they have a computer and access to the internet. People can go on a website and use the What's My Number campaign to change power retailers. That's your answer, Mr Bridges. Well, you know what, Mr Bridges? 
for a lot of families, they're lucky. You don't need to scream at me. You don't need to scream at me. I know, I know this is sensitive because you know that you've failed in this area. But for most families I deal with, they're lucky if they can get one electricity retailer to pick them up. The idea that they have a choice, Mr Bridges, is pure fantasy land, la-la stuff, and shows how arrogant and out of touch this Minister of Energy is. Just how out of touch they are. They're lucky if they can get one power retailer. And you know, most of the difference in power prices actually comes from early payment discounts. That's the big difference. Well, an early payment discount doesn't matter if you can't pay the bill, Mr Bridges. You don't get the early payment discount if you can't afford to pay the power bill. Oh, a little light bulb goes on over his head. So the What's My Number campaign does nothing for the poorest families in this country. It actually does nothing for many of the middle class families in this country. But that's this government's solution to power prices. That's this government's solution. So I want to come on to the issue of housing that my, um, that my colleague uh, Phil Twyford talked about. And I want to talk about social housing a little bit, because in the provinces what we've had is we used to have a waiting list of category A, category B, C and D um, in declining uh, uh, need. And what this government did is they said, you know what, anyone who's category C or D, we're going to kick them off the waiting list. That category no longer exists because they're not needy. That's absolutely true. And in the provinces... And I know in Gisborne, 80% of our waiting list, 80% of our waiting list was category C and D. And it's not that these people are wealthy; it's that it's that they're, they're, uh, the, the rents of which we base the income-related rents are lower than they are in the cities. So it's not these people's income is high; it's that the average rent is low. But we don't have enough landlords in provincial New Zealand to meet the need. That's where social housing fills an incredible, an incredible. I live in Gisborne. Oh, for God's sake, that's how pathetic it is. I don't live in Gisborne when I live in Gisborne. That's what, that's, that's what Simon Bridges is choosing to focus on. This is a man who, in his electorate, had a family living in a tent for five weeks. Right. Five weeks they were living in a tent. What did you do about that? Okay. Nothing. Why don't you just talk about how I don't live in Gisborne? Yeah. That's how seriously this government is taking the difficulties facing families in this country. So. If I go back to it, what happens is we have state houses sitting empty right across New Zealand. Three and a half thousand houses sitting empty right across New Zealand while families are living in tents. And How does that make sense? We have four and a half thousand people on the Housing New Zealand waiting list, and that's ignoring the 5,000 people they kicked off category C and D. This government's social housing plan is to kick people off waiting lists. Uh, stop putting people into houses so that they can then pretend that there's no need and then have an excuse to flog the houses off. That's what they right. did the last time they were in government. So right. we shouldn't be surprised. Shouldn't be surprised. They hocked off nearly 13,000 state houses in the 1990s. Now, when we were in government, we managed to rebuild nearly 8,000 houses. And that was despite the fact we were going through a building boom. And you couldn't get a builder for love nor money because we had to rebuild that housing stock. We brought income-related rents back. We started the maintenance program that had stopped under the national government. Now, in nine years, you know what? We didn't get to repair all the damage wreaked by nine years of a national government. We didn't. And had we won again in 2008, we would have continued to repair the damage done to social housing by the 1990s national government. But unfortunately, all we're seeing is history repeating itself. It's, you know, it's dressed up differently. Crosby Texter have put a different spin on it. But it's the same old Tory policies. Right. Kick people out of social housing. They don't deserve to be there. Kick them while they're down. Rather than using social housing, seeing social housing as the one opportunity governments have to provide security in a family's life. We don't get to do it with any other intervention that we have as government. But with housing, we do. We can give people a home. We can give them a community. When there is social housing, we can connect them to the support that they need. Because let's be honest, Housing New Zealand is often the, house, the, the landlord of last resort. It is. But if we just keep kicking people out of social housing, where do they go? They don't disappear. They don't suddenly vanish and, 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 and not be a problem anymore. They just become someone else's problem. Right. And we never, ever get to the root of that problem. And you see this when you saw in Gisborne, an 80-year-old man who had a stroke, who was in a Housing New Zealand house. Housing New Zealand approved his nephew moving in to look after the house, do the maintenance, look after the gardens while he was in hospital. Well, the nephew uh, planted some dope on the property. The police came in. There was an investigation. The 80-year-old the man was completely incapacitated after a stroke. He got evicted oh. 
from its Housing New Zealand house because this lot are so inflexible when it comes to housing that they couldn't see that it wasn't that elderly gentleman's fault. He'd been in that home for 50 years. It was his home. And Housing New Zealand locally were distraught that they had to evict him, but they said there is no wiggle room. We are no longer allowed to take... Thank you, Mr Heatley, for that, by the way. We are no longer allowed to take the personal circumstances of those tenants uh, into consideration when making these decisions. That's the New Zealand we now live in. That's going to change this Order. year when we elect a Labour government. Very good speech. Honourable Toe Henare.